Welcome everyone. I'm BK, director of the Park Maintenance Institute. Uh, thank you for joining us for our next session of Shop Talk. Today we are going to be focusing a bit more on sustainability since the Institute has been written into Pennsylvania's statewide comprehensive outdoor rec plan as uh, trying to help create more impacts and uh, emphasize sustainable systems being operations and uh, environmental issues within our parks and public open spaces. Uh, I've been reaching out to various organizations that have similar goals and initiatives. And so uh, one of those resources out there that has focused for a long time here in the U.S. and internationally, focusing on bird habitat is the Audubon Society. And so I figured this would be an excellent opportunity to reach out and partner up and see how we can share our expertises on both sides and make an uh, opportunity for us to educate further and help expand people's uh, resources and depth. So there is a need to educate managers of public open spaces about sustainable techniques, especially for managing forest habitats while meeting other goals, such as timber management, tree regeneration, and recreation. So for this session of Shop Talk, we've invited Ron Rohrbaugh, who is the Director of Conservation Science and Forest Programs for Audubon Mid-Atlantic. Uh, he's going to present on forest management practices in woodlots and large forest tracts that help improve habitat for forest birds while also meeting goals of multiple stakeholder groups. So Ron's going to be discussing the unique power that birds have and it, how they are a barometer for the health of our environments within our communities. And he's going to talk a little bit about what some of the driving landscape scale forest management practices there are to help those birds with their environment and ours. So we're going to be talking today and learning about uh, the different statuses and habitats and needs for forest dwelling birds. We're going to gain a better understanding on how to evaluate forest health and habitat qualities in various scales. We're going to identify forest management practices that produce desired habitat conditions. And we're also gonna discuss how to plan for challenges such as deer over browsing, I'm sorry, deer over browsing and invasive plants, something that all of our resources, land managers, parks, and even homeowners are always fighting against. So without rambling on too much further, I'm going to hand the talking stick over to Ron. Great, thank you, very much appreciated. Um, that uh, sounds like a tall order you just uh, threw at me. There's a lot to cover. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're going to talk about forest management and birds today. And uh, let me just give you a little bit, slight bit more background on the talk. And then I'll tell you a little bit about myself and we'll dig right into the details. And since we're a pretty small group this afternoon, um, we can keep this pretty informal. So if you have questions um, you know, feel free to turn your camera on, put your, your hand up, and, you know, and you can ask uh, through your mic or if you want to type a question into chat, and uh, we can probably address them in real time if you want to, since we're a pretty small, small group here. So yeah, we're going to talk about what Audubon calls bird-friendly forest management or silviculture. And I think about it as, as ways in which you can use birds to improve forest health in, you know, from, from small woodlots all the way on, on up to the landscape scale. And so what you might think of when you think about bird conservation and forest management or protection is just that protection. You know, the best thing that we can do for our forests, or excuse me, for our birds, is to do nothing with our forests. And what we're going to discover today is that that's often not true. Sometimes it is true that simple protection um, is the way to go. But what we're gonna learn is that because of a history of poor management and because of a lot of contemporary stressors in our forest systems, they often need 
you know, anywhere from just a small amount of management to actually quite a lot of management to optimize their ability to support birds and other wildlife. And that management often goes hand in hand with supporting other sorts of goals, um, such as recreation, including obviously bird watching, but also hunting, um, you know, keeping cold water fisheries cold for fishing, timber production, clean water, and of course, you know, growing forests for our future through re regenerating trees. So let's move on a little, oops, move on a little bit here. Why is that not working? Look at this very first slide and we're having technical difficulties. There we go. So I wanna tell you a little bit about myself before we, we go much further. Um, it's always good to, to um, you know, to understand and, and know a little bit about the person that, you know, is giving a presentation or who you're talking with. So I grew up here in Pennsylvania, um, the south central part of the state, um, down near the Harrisburg, Carlisle area. And I had a, you know, a fascination with the outdoors, you know, right off the bat. Uh, my dad was a hunter and I followed him all through the woods. Um, my grandparents were birders, and so I spent a lot of time bird watching at their homes. Um, and then when it came time for me to, you know, to head off after I graduated from high school and figure out what I was going to do uh, with my life, I, I landed at Penn State University, and it was pretty clear, you know, what I would focus on. I ended up with degrees in wildlife biology, forestry, and ecology. And then moved out west for a short stint and worked in tall grass prairie systems. And then finally, in an effort to get back a little closer to my family, I ended up in upstate New York at Cornell University. And I worked at Cornell for almost 25 years, um, focusing mainly on birds. I did a lot of endangered species work, um, work similar to what I'm doing today with the National Audubon Society, focused on forest management and conservation. I also worked on renewable energy, looking at the impacts of things like uh, wind farms on birds. So it uh, kind of ran the gamut uh, across my career. Um, I'm now back in Pennsylvania. I work for Audubon Mid-Atlantic as the Director of Conservation Science and Forest Programs. I've only been here about three years, and so I know that sounds like it might be a, a modest amount of time. It's, it feels like uh, I'm still getting my feet wet, you know, with, with Audubon. Uh, it feels very familiar to be back in, in Pennsylvania since I grew up here. But, you know, whenever you're uh, making a big career move, it always uh, feels perhaps more abrupt than you hope it will. So um, with that, I want to go ahead and jump in. So today, the key topics we're going to cover, we're going to talk a little bit about how birds are important in driving the forest management we've been talking about. We'll talk about the status of forest bird populations. Are they going up? Are they going down? Um, we'll talk about Audubon's Healthy Forest Program and how we're implementing that here in Pennsylvania and across the Mid-Atlantic. And then we'll talk about some of the forest management strategies. Now, here's where we won't be able to dive into a lot of detail simply because it becomes uh, very involved and is very stand-based or situational-based. So every forest stand requires a slightly different prescription. And so there's not a one-size-fits-all sort of approach. So we're going to take you right up to the precipice, right up to the edge of, you know, how you begin doing some of this work. And then I'm going to refer you to some references, you know, if you're interested in, in you know, how you dig in and actually understand um, what silvicultural practices are best for supporting some of these bird populations and improving overall forest health. Before we get there though, I wanna talk about something that I call the power of birds because this is really important to the approach that I use personally to thinking about uh, restoring ecosystems and managing habitat for birds, whether it's in a forest or a grassland or whatever it is. So birds are different than other taxonomic groups that we might be familiar with. They're different in that we can connect to them in some obvious ways. So birds sing, um, they make a lot of sound. We're all used to hearing things like robins and red-winged blackbirds and wood thrush, which we're gonna hear at the end of this program. And that song that they sing in and their calls 
uh, are almost a one-to-one -one match for the frequency range of human speech and human hearing. So we can connect with birds at an auditory scale. So we, we can hear them, we can appreciate their sounds as they're singing. Birds also see in color, oh, humans see in color. Most mammals don't see in color. Most mammals see in black and white. So it's, you know, it's another way in which we can connect with birds that we might not be able to connect with other animals um, simply because they're not as colorful. In fact, a lot of mammals live in a scent-based world. That's how they communicate. They don't communicate with bright colors. They don't communicate with songs that match our own human hearing. They communicate by smelling one another. So I always say, you know, what, what do two dogs do when they first meet each other? Yeah, sniff each other's butts, right? So, you know, that's not what we do. We, you know, and that's not how we interact with birds. So, you know, birds are, are really great organisms to get people excited about being outdoors and understanding nature and understanding how birds then connect back to the other parts of an ecosystem. So much so that there's a large community of bird watchers who keep lists and are willing to contribute the data uh, from those lists to projects like eBird. eBird is a um, community science program of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and it allows birders to enter their observations in lists no matter what they're doing, uh, lists from their backyard, their um, yearly lists, their vacation list, whatever it happens to be, their list from the weekend of just gone birding at the local state park. Um, there are lots of very easy ways in which to do this. And there are more than two million eBirders and um, you know, more than at this point, the slide says 590 million observations. Um, that's pretty low at this point. I think we're up to more like 750 million observations in eBird. And this allows for some really robust science. So we can build these multi-layered statistical models to tell us a lot about birds. So this map you see that's, the, that's animated and rolling through some colors here is not just a pretty map. That's actually 52 statistical models with more than 100 environmental variables all stacked on top of each other, predicting where we'll see the wood thrush throughout the full 12 months of the year. So we'll start back here in the winter. They're on the wintering grounds right now in Mexico and Central America. We're in February. The Sioux that just busted across the Gulf of Mexico on the breeding grounds moving around a little bit. Now watch, they're gonna come back through Florida, back across the Gulf of Mexico and back onto the wintering grounds. So you can see that full annual cycle. Um, also, I'll point out a couple of things. You can see that Pennsylvania is almost always lit up in a dark blue or purple color during the breeding season. Very important state for um, the wood thrush. And another, one last thing I'll point out is look at the size of the breeding distribution covering almost all of the Northeast and, mid and Midwest. And then look at the area they pack into on the wintering ground. It's about one third of the size. So that tells you a little bit about some of the important places for conservation. While it's important to, to focus on these birds on the breeding ground, um, the wintering grounds are also very important. So how do we use that sort of information, this power of birds to implement bird conservation? we can actually dig in and start to predict some of the most important places. And this, uh, these are maps of what I call the spatio-temporal area importance. And that sounds jargony and technical, but it basically is just showing you the most important places in space and time for these species. So this is a snapshot um, showing the important places during the breeding season. So let's just, I don't know the exact date, but let's just call it June 15th. And we can see how important Pennsylvania, West Virginia, parts of Ohio and New York are for the wood thrush on the left. And in fact, we know that Pennsylvania has responsibility, as I like to call it, for about eight and a half percent or about one million wood thrush um, each year during the breeding season. And then you can also see the distribution for the golden winged warbler where it looks like Pennsylvania is not very important. But in fact, if you zoom in on that map of Pennsylvania, you'll see uh, a number of clusters of breeding populations 
So the state is important from those small uh, populations that are present. And it's also important from the standpoint of, of reconnecting to subpopulations. So the golden winged warbler, uh, which by the way, we're gonna talk a lot about, it's a species that specializes on using young forest habitat. Um, so think of forests from basically zero to about 10 to maybe 20 years old at the max. The population used to be one consistent population that arced from the Great Lakes down through the Mid-Atlantic and into the, the central Appalachians. You can see now that it's separated and that separation mainly exists in Pennsylvania. And so one goal is to try to reconnect those subpopulations. So we've got a, a meta population of golden winged warblers um, from the central apps all the way up through Great Lakes states. All right, so that's how birds are important, and how they're powerful, how the interest around birds from birders can tell us a lot about where they are and how to prioritize. We also know that birds are incredible bioindicators. They tell us a lot about the health of our ecosystems. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that in a minute. But what about the status of birds? How are bird populations doing? For the moment, let's focus on the right side of this slide. So the, the multiple bar charts there. It was a paper that came out in October of 2019 in the journal Science that showed that we'd lost about 2.9 billion birds in the last 50 years. And the, the, the genius of this paper wasn't just in the, the ways in which they estimated those declines, but also how they estimated declines over various ecosystems. So I wanna point a few things out to you. Um, the, the largest bar extending to the left of the middle line, which indicates a decline, is in grassland situations. So birds that occupy grassland habitats are in big, big trouble. They've lost more than 50% of their overall population in the last 50 years. So we, you know, that's a, a, a group of species that really need a lot of attention. And maybe after the, the main part of the talk, we can talk a little bit more, uh, more about why that's the case and what's happening in grasslands. If you look at the very top of the graph, you'll see that wetland birds are the only group of birds that are increasing. It's the only bar shooting over to the right there. And that's because we've done a pretty good job of protecting and restoring wetland systems because humans also rely on those wetland systems. We rely on clean drinking water and we rely on wetlands to buffer us from flooding. And so, you know, <clears throat> groups like Ducks Unlimited um, and lots of other groups that are, that are focused specifically on wetland habitats um, have really done a great job of bringing those wetland bird species back. Now, if we drop down to the green bar that says Eastern forest, you'll see that Eastern forest birds are falling about the middle of the pack. Um, and in fact, we've lost about 170 million individual birds from the Eastern forest system in the last 50 years. And that's about 17% of the overall population. And this is problematic. I mean, we, we've got a number of reasons um, you know, for what's happening here. You know, I like to think about, about the work that I do on birds in, in two different ways. One way is that, you know, on the left side of this slide, we have, we're showing declines of birds in the Eastern forest system. And so the work that we do at Audubon is focused on stabilizing and recovering those populations. But we also know that birds are great indicators of the health of systems, including forest systems. And so by knowing that those species are declining and knowing specifically where they are declining, it helps us to understand what's going wrong with our forest, where we have certain kinds of stressors and how we can begin to address those. And those stressors include things like Japanese stiltgrass, which is this uh, image right here you see that's carpeting the forest floor. It includes fragmentation from all sorts of, of uh, kinds of development from, uh, you know, housing developments to commercial development, overbrowsing by white-tailed deer, and other pests like emerald ash borer. 
So we focus a lot on private lands in our, our group. And I know that most of you are involved in municipalities or park systems. So um, this isn't as applicable to you, but I just you know, wanted to kind of get give you a sense of it. 80% of Eastern forest birds rely on private land. That sounds like a lot, but the 20% that are on public land or municipal lands is huge because those are places where we have the greatest opportunity to work. So private land is, is just that, it's privately held. Um, in Pennsylvania, there's some 790,000 individual private families who own the forest land. It's difficult to work with each of those families and it's tough to scale the work, which is why I like working with land trusts, um, municipal managers, other land managers like yourselves, um, who are able to, to impact much larger areas um, with their conservation planning and management programs. That's one of those 80-20 rules in application, I suppose, you know, the old saying. Yeah. So let's take a look now at some of these, these individual species. These are kind of um, some of our priority birds that we work on around Pennsylvania and frankly, you know, much of the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, um, you know, are, are, are home to these species uh, where these birds are declining. So let's look first at the cerulean warbler. That's this guy right here. Um, this is a neotropical migrant songbird. It's a warbler, obviously. Um, the total population size is estimated to be around 570,000 individual birds. We've lost about 72% of that population in the last 50 plus years. And then this number, the half-life, that's a, um, an estimate of the number of years that it will take for the cerulean warbler population to be halved again. So that's 26 years. So, you know, that's within the lifetimes of, of you know, most of us, I can't see all of you, so I don't know how old you are, um, but that's within the lifetimes of, you know, all of us on this call, let's say. So, you know, we have to worry then, we have a small population to begin with of only 570,000 cerulean warblers. Um, and then if we have that again in just 26 years, what happens is that we begin to reach that, uh, that tipping point where we've gotten with other species like the Kirtland's warbler or the California condor or the spotted owl, where it becomes very difficult to recover a population when it gets so small. And I won't go over the numbers for all of these, but you know, other birds that are of high priority here include the Canada warbler, the golden winged warbler, and the wood thrush. And then I also have on this slide um, some other species of high interest, including the ruffed grouse, the wild turkey. Um, those are species that benefit greatly from work on behalf of those songbirds. And then also the northern goshawk, uh, a species of concern throughout much of the mid-Atlantic. So there are lots of ways in which these birds can tell us about the health of forest systems. They're sensitive to the area of forest, so how much forest is out there. They're sensitive to soil chemistry, so um, do we have highly acidic soil that tends to reduce the number of uh, invertebrate prey in the soil from th things like acid deposition and methyl mercury um, that's, that gets into the soil from burning fossil fuels. Birds are, are, are sensitive to all of those things. But those things can be difficult for us as managers to influence. They can be influenced, but they're difficult. The one thing we can influence more easily is forest age and structure. So we can work with the forest we have to optimize it for habitat so that we can increase the carrying capacity for birds across the landscape. And at the same time, I want to continue to point this out, at the same time, meeting multiple goals for things like timber production and clean water. Um, this is driven by birds, but it's not all about birds. So let's talk a little bit about the scales that you should be thinking about if you're interested in managing for birds across properties for which you have some, some management authority or some purview. So we think of it as the landscape scale, the stand scale and the nest or territory scale. 
the landscape scale, um, you know, to kind of simplify this, I think of it as a, a roughly a one mile radius. So if you think about a place where you're going to manage for birds, or not even manage for birds, a place where there's management potential, you're doing a timber harvest, there's a parking lot going in, whatever it is, any kind of activity that's going to happen in that place, you can think about how that's going to impact birds and how birds can drive your thinking in roughly a one mile radius around that spot. That's the landscape scale. Then we work down to the stand scale. The stand scale is that patch of forest in which a bird would choose to set up a territory and nest. It could be anywhere from, you know, let's just say 25 acres on up to, you know, 2,500 acres or even more. Could be much, much larger. And then there's the nest and territory scale. That, those are the conditions that exist right around the nest site itself or within, let's say, let's call it a half an acre, you know, around the nest. That gets down to a level of detail where it's very difficult to manage at the nest and territory scale. So we're going to focus today on the landscape scale and the stand scale. So this is a little anthropomorphic, but I think it gets the point across. So wood thrush are neotropical migratory birds. They spend the winter in Mexico and parts of Central America. They return to their breeding range, which includes the mid-Atlantic mid region for breeding each spring, usually in May. And so, you know, as that wood thrush is returning, it's making some decisions. You know, which, which woodlot am I going to breed in? Which territory am I going to, to establish within that woodlot? And where am I going to build my nest site within that territory? And so again, this gets back to that landscape scale, stand scale, nest site scale. So at that, that decision-making point when this wood thrush is returning, there are some rules of thumb that we can apply. So if you've got a, a forest situation where you've got at least 70% forest in the landscape, let's get back to that one mile radius. You've got 70, if you've got a one mile radius that's 70% forest, you wanna try to maintain 10 to 20% of that 70% area in young forest. So that means you could do some timber harvesting. You could create young forest habitat by doing something like a, uh, what we today we would call an overstory removal. Uh, in years past, you might have called that a clear cut or other kinds of silviculture, which create this young forest habitat. If you have less than 70% forest in that landscape, then you want to be very careful about taking, about creating more young forest, about cutting forest. So if you've got large forest stands that are bigger than 200 acres, can get away with doing a little bit, maybe creating 10% young forest. If you have less than 40% forest and it's highly fragmented, this gets back to the notion of protecting, restoring, and connecting, then we're probably not going to recommend timber harvesting, but maintain your forest the way it is. Try to connect the woodlots and try to restore, we'll talk about this in a moment, um, what we call vertical structure in your forest. And if we were thinking of this on the, the urban forest scale, for example, I mean, is that a completely different conversation or can it kind of fit within those numbers as well? Yeah, no, it, that's a great question. It, it does fit within those numbers. So if we look at the last bullet here where we have less than 40% forest, that's what you're going to have in most urban situations. So you're not going to be creating any young forest um, you're probably the, the most, the thing you'll do most often is to try to restore vertical structure in your forest stand. And when I say forest stand in this urban forest situation, that might be as little as five acres. Um, and we'll talk more about how you can restore that vertical structure and why there is no vertical structure. And we'll talk about what vertical structure is. Okay. So now thinking about this, you know, now transitioning from, all right, we kind of have a rule of thumb for the landscape scale. Now zoom your thinking in one notch to the stand scale. This is the woodlot scale, the patch scale. We've understood for a long time the distribution of birds, you know, across various age classes in those stands. 
For example, we know that the woodcock, the American woodcock here and the golden winged warbler, they like very young forest. We know that the Canada warbler likes a little bit older age class forest. And we know that birds like the black-throated blue warbler, the cerulean warbler, and the wood thrush are found in these more mature forest stands. What we didn't know is this part that we're just learning. So these birds are very small and very light in weight. So the golden-winged warbler that is there at your left weighs the same as two dimes and a nickel, roughly. So if you have two dimes and a nickel in your pocket and you take them out and hold them in your hand, that's what that bird weighs. So it's very difficult to attach devices to animals that are that small and track them through space, because especially a bird, because a bird has to be able to fly and a bird has something called wing loading. And if you put too much weight on the bird, you're, the wing loading is gonna increase too much and the bird won't be able to fly and we can't do that. So it's only been in the last 10 years where we've, we've had these little devices called geolocators that allow us to track birds through space. And what we've learned from that is that birds don't stay, they don't remain associated with the age class of forest in which they nest. So two good examples of that, the golden winged warbler breeds in young forest. Let's just say that forest is five years old. It's a very young stand. But as soon as their young fledge from the nest, they move their family groups to older forest where they forage and get ready for the fall migration. The wood thrush does the opposite. The wood thrush breeds in that older forest. And then when it's young fledge from the nest, it moves its family group to the young forest to breed in preparation for migration. So now if you're thinking about all of this, you realize then that it's not that easy just to create a bunch of young forest or maintain a bunch of old forest. You have to be able to have both of those age classes and in fact, multiple age classes on the landscape at the same time. It's this idea of a shifting mosaic of forest age classes. So you have the golden ring warbler, or I'm sorry, the wood thrush nesting in old forest and then moving to young forest, you have Technology is messing up. You have golden wing nesting in young forest, moving to old. And then you have these other species. We know they move. We don't understand them as well, but moving all over the forest and landscape. And so you need a forest system that looks like the one we're looking at here, where you have lots of old forest, but plenty of young patches of forest too, for these species to meet the, the needs of their full breeding cycle. So how do we do that and what's wrong with the, the current system that we have? Well, we have too little young forest in the landscape. Um, much of the forest from, from Maine to Georgia was cleared 80 to 120 years ago. That forest has grown back up in an even age state. So if we go around states like Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, um, West Virginia, what we discover is that the bulk of the forest is in that same age range, 80 to 120 years. Um, it's all the same. And so there's a lack of young forest in the system. Young forest is pretty easy to create, but you have to be careful. Um, you know, it is functionally creating clear cuts that can be harmful in places they can create, sometimes create fragmentation and other issues. And so it's not an excuse just to go out and cut timber. We have to be very strategic in thinking about where we position those young forests. The other issue is that all of that, that forest grew up that's 80 to 120 years old and is now subject to a lot of stressors in the environment. Um, over browsing by white-tailed deer, things like hay sand and fern and, and Japanese stiltgrass that create a forest that looks like the one in the right here. Um, it's, it's middle-aged, it has absolutely no understory. We can see right through it. Um, that is not a healthy forest. A forest should have multiple vertical layers from the ground all the way up into the, into the middle canopy um, that provide nesting and foraging substrate for the birds that we're talking about. So how do we get there? So this is where I'll talk a little bit about Audubon's program. 
So what we're doing as part of Audubon's Healthy Forest Program is, is kind of two approaches. One, I think of as science to action. So we establish these things called forest bird conservation centers um, where we can identify stakeholders, we can identify opportunities to begin managing habitat. Um, that's what I think of as bird driven forest management. And we work with, you know, we work with those stakeholders. So the Pennsylvania Game Commission, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, private um, landowners, and we inject the science directly into the conservation planning to try to make it happen. The other thing we do is we work directly with folks like yourselves, foresters, land managers, um, people who are every day thinking about how to better manage the lands that they have responsibility for. And so we offer um, training workshops and pre-COVID, pre um, these were in-person workshops uh, anywhere from a day and a half to two full days long um, where we would spend roughly a day, you know, indoors doing lecture style teaching and then a half a day or so outside visiting demonstration areas. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit now. This is where I can't dig into too much detail simply because it becomes too complicated. But we can divide forest systems into two rough age classes, mature and young forest. We've already been talking about a bunch of these birds. In mature for forest, it's wood thrush, black-throated blue warbler, and cerulean warbler. In young forest, it's American woodcock, golden-winged warbler, prairie warbler in this case. There are others. These are just some kind of uh, flagship species that we might want to think about. So what about the mature forest? What is it that we need in that forest that we don't have? Well, it's this complex vertical structure we've been talking about. So if we look at this forest, you can see that you can't see through it. It contains what we think of as the green wall. There's a lot of vertical structure here. There's places for birds to nest. So you get this layering. And you can create that in a number of different ways um, by being selective in your timber harvests and functionally opening up the canopy to mimic things like um, natural disturbance, wind throw, fire, that sort of thing. Get some sunlight to the forest floor and get it to regenerate so you get wildflowers, shrubs, and regenerating trees in the understory through creating canopy gaps. This is where being prepared is important. While all that is pretty easy to implement, the stressors don't go away. Japanese stilt grass doesn't go away. If it's there and you open up the canopy, it's gonna take off. You have to be prepared to deal with it through an herbicide treatment. The deer are not gonna go away. If you create a canopy gap, you're gonna create perfect habitat for deer. And so you have to think about fencing or think about using the slash, the debris from a timber harvest to create a natural fence around your site. Um, there are different ways to, um, you know, to, to have things called stump covers. So you can drop or pull the top of a felled tree on top of a stump, which allows the stump to stump sprout and regrow, but makes it difficult for deer to kind of get in there and do their thing. So a number of different ways to ameliorate the effects of exotic invasive plants and deer. Young forest too is not all that difficult to create. So we can, uh, under the right circumstances and the right candidate forests, we can go in and remove some high percentage of the basal area or the volume of the forest, leaving some what we call reserves. So these are reserve trees that are left for seed, for shade, and for birds like golden-winged warbler, they're even used for, for song posts, places for, for birds to sing, and they create the structure that these species need. And so the big considerations when creating young forest habitat patches um, are to think about the, um, the volume of residual trees you want to leave, and, and we'll get to that in a minute about some of the specifics of that volume related to individual species. You wanna protect some of the high value species like dogwood, grapevine, serviceberry. Those are all species that provide good nest substrate and they provide um, food in the way of, of fruits. And probably the biggest thing, the easiest thing to do 
is to not create regular shaped patches. So you don't want to go into a forest stand and create a rectangle or a square. You want it to be um, a polygon. You want it to have irregular edges and an irregular shape. You don't have, if the, you know, whatever the, the residual basal area is, the residual number of trees you're leaving behind, it doesn't have to be evenly distributed across the patch. You can leave islands of trees or leave a lot of them at one side and fewer at the other side. Nature is not symmetric and so, or symmetrical, I don't know what's more grammatically correct there. Um, so you know, it doesn't have to be this uniform look that a lot of, of people want to create. It can be messy. Um, the other thing to think about is that you don't want hard edges where your young forest meets your old forest. You want that to become what we call a feathered edge or a stepped edge. So work back in maybe 100 feet so that you're gradually going from young shrubby forest into older age class forest. And this helps to prevent um, a lot of predation that happens at edges. So you get things like raccoons and skunks that just work down a hard edge and pick off all the bird nests that are there. Um, that's a symptom of fragmentation. But if you create that softer edge, um, you ameliorate that a little bit. A quick this question jumping in and just kind of thinking you know, on the, the, the HOA level and thinking of developing park level and things like that. Now, can this principles basically be reverse engineered in the sense of going from, instead of going from the mindset of taking a mature forest and clearing down to certain points, what about building back up since that's kind of what Pennsylvania naturally wants to do anyways is become a forest once again. You know, what if we're going from that already cleared area and trying to That's forward really think good. in our master planning? Do we kind of just use those same concepts of what do we do, or is there a different process? No, it's, it, yeah, you're right. Reverse engineer is a great way to think about it. You can use the same process. The one thing I would caution on, I deal with this a lot, is um, making sure we understand the conservation value and the conflicts. So remember back in the beginning of the talk, we talked about grassland birds and how they were taking a big dive. So we need to make sure that whatever we're trying to reforest and to recreate into forest doesn't already have birds like grass, grasshopper sparrows or henslow sparrows or upland sandpipers. Make sure, just, just think more holistically about the, con the existing conservation value of the place and what your goal is going forward. If that goal then is to is to, to restore forest, then yeah, and especially let's just say you have abandoned uh, abandoned pasture land that's next to an older woodlot, and you want to work those two together. You want to connect them and create a bigger patch of forest, one young, one old. You can manage that abandoned pasture land to get it to come along into young forest by doing some plantings, you can plant trees in there. Um, if it's become too brushy and choked out already and no trees are regenerating because you've got, it's full of, you know, multiflora rose and rubus, you can get in there with a brush hog and open it up a little bit and create some open grassy patches that you can then plant trees in to create these islands of, um, you know, regenerating trees, which will eventually grow tall and and become this kind of patchy forest situation. So yeah, you can absolutely, you know, work from the other direction. Great, because th those are some of the thoughts maybe some of our park folks and land managers are taking over golf courses that have gone belly up or, you know, large mm -hmm. tracts of, like you said, family farms that the family turned it back over to the municipality or the county. And now what do we right. do with it? And, and so we don't waste it. Yeah, absolutely. So here's the kind of the jumping off point. Um, it gets every stand of forest is different and managing it is, I always say forestry is as much art as it is science. Yes, there's a lot of science that goes into it, but there's also a lot of uh, thinking about what you can do with that particular palette. And so there's Oh, just a ton of good information out there. So for example, there's an entire set of best management practices 
for managing for the golden winged warbler in the Appalachian region. There's another set of best management practices that focus on the wood thrush and the scarlet tanager. And the one that I wanna focus on now, which I think will be most useful to you, is a new publication that just came out about nine months ago called Healthy Forests, a bird-based silvicultural guide for forestry professionals. Um, it, it works together with this publication on the right, the Forest Bird Pocket Guide. It was uh, put out by Audubon Mid-Atlantic. It's available on our website, and I can give you the link to that in a little bit. And what it does that's different from a lot of these other best management practice guides is it tries to walk you through the different silvicultural options and management scenarios by laying out um, various scenarios that are common in forest stand situations. So we can't cover them all. The permutations are you know, all over the place. But you know, for example, on the right, we have uh, example stand one, and we have a description over here. It's an 80 to 90 year old stand. It's oak and hickory uh, with some northern hardwoods. It's well stocked. It has little to no um, desirable understory. So that's pretty typical of stands you might find in Pennsylvania. Then we walk you through how do you, how do you improve the value of that stand for the landowner? And that landowner could be a municipality. Um, you know, thinking about the future monetary value of a stand. How do you maintain other ecosystem services? And how do you improve the quality of it for birds and other wildlife? And so the guide walks you through all of those sorts of, of scenarios and the, the silvicultural options. It also walks you through the landscape scale. I think of this as a, as a uh, a decision-making tool. It's a kind of, you know, if you walk through kind of a, a decision tree um, to think about what to do in those, as, as we were talking about earlier, in those urban landscapes where you might have very little forest compared to municipalities, say, that are in places with 70 plus percent forest. How do you think differently about those two things and what questions do you ask? Um, this decision support framework walks you through that. And then the pocket guide, um, which is the companion to the, to the main healthy forest piece, is super helpful for land managers and, and foresters in that, you know, most folks are not birders. Most folks are not ornithologists. They don't understand um, the distribution of birds or what habitats they use or need at various times of the year. And so this guide focuses on 18 different species and shows you, and it is written specifically for Pennsylvania, so it shows you you know, within Pennsylvania where a species is distributed. Um, this shows you uh, a little bit about uh, the desired forest conditions that you want, about 50 to 80 percent canopy cover. It shows you over here where nest building happens. This is a little nest cup, uh, which in that zone is up to about six feet. That sort of thing and gives you some other tips down here uh, about how to manage for a species. So Using this in combination with the Healthy Forest Guide uh, as a great recipe for success, I hope. All right, so heading toward a wrap up. Um, how in the heck do you get it done? So, you know, where do you find money to do this sort of thing? It's complicated. Um, when you have a commercial harvest, so let's say you're managing habitat for golden winged warbler. And that means you're removing a high volume of timber. That timber has value. You're going to sell it commercially. And you're probably funding your habitat management project by the material you're removing from the site. That, you know, is sometimes the case, but not often. Um, just as often, whatever you're doing is a non-commercial harvest. And you have to have some other way to support the cost. Either it has to come from the municipality's pocket, the landowner's pocket, somebody has to pay for it. There are a number of programs that can help you do that. Um, probably the most well-known are the NRCS programs from the Farm Bill, uh, like Working Lands for Wildlife and EQIP. These are cost share programs that are very bird driven. Um, and so you can find money um, to help support habitat management on those lands through the NRCS programs. There's other opportunities from Fish and Wildlife Service and NIFWF 
And I want to point out one that Audubon is now involved with and I'm very excited about, and that's related to um, carbon sequestration. So in, in you know, recent years, we've realized that, you know, we've always known that forests sequester a lot of carbon, but we've also realized that that's a value that many landowners have not known about or been able to take advantage of. It has real monetary value. And it's been hard to, to access that value. But there's a new program by the American Forest Foundation called the Family Forest Carbon Program. And that program pays municipalities and landowners, other landholders, money to implement practices that sequester more carbon in the forest. It does not pay the landowner for the amount of carbon sequestered in the forest. It pays for the practice itself, which is a much better situation for the landowner. Yeah, because so, you don't have to calculate how much you're actually capturing at that point then. That's right. All of that responsibility then is shifted to AFF. So what they do is they pay the landowner to implement the practice they estimate the amount of carbon being sequestered, and then AFF sells those carbon credits on the market. And that way they get, that, that's their income stream to bring more money back into the program to pay more landowners. And so a couple of years ago, I wrote a grant to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and got money to partner with AFF and figure out how we can begin managing habitat in a way that optimizes habitat for birds and optimizes carbon sequestration and gets landowners paid for implementing that science-based management. And so we're just about a year and a half into this now. It's going extremely well. Um, so we're, we're getting landowners some value out of their properties without having to take out the marketable timber. And at the same time, improving the health of the forest for birds, other wildlife, and ecosystem services. So it's a great win-win. Uh, um, and the Family Forest, family, it's a mouthful to say, Family Forest Carbon Program is right now uh, only in portions of Pennsylvania, but will go statewide pretty soon, and will also be extended, expanded to other states soon, like New York and North Carolina. And where can folks find out about that on the Audubon site or like, where is the best place for them to dig more into that? Well, that is a great question for this slide. So the back of the Healthy Forest Guide um, lists a number of resources. And the very first one, because they're in alphabetical order, is the American Forest Foundation. And so it tells you a little bit of information about the Family Forest Carbon Program and provides uh, information about how to find more by going to their website. So if you, if you have the Healthy Forest Guide, um, you can find out more about the Family Forest Carbon Program and uh, about all of the, the resources. So we list a number here from NIFWIF to the Pennsylvania Game Commission to Penn State Extension, uh, a whole host of places where you can find out resources about forest management and especially about birds. And so just kind of to wrap up things, you know, I think about birds as being this nexus to healthy forests. If you allow birds to drive the system at all scales, you end up with preserved ecosystem services, quality habitat for birds and, and game species and, and other animals, and all of these ancillary benefits that include timber value, recreation, local products, such as a big push right now um, toward bird-friendly maple products, mainly, um, you know, ma uh, sugar maple, uh, maple syrup, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, so, you know, I think of it as, you know, if you really kind of get your mind wrapped around this, if you pick up the Healthy Forest Guide and read it, um, you'll see that birds can really drive a lot of things. And birds aren't, you know, it's not everything, but it really, they really can help you to think about holistic sorts of approaches to forest management. And so I'm gonna wrap up um, by playing a few sounds. So this is the wood thrush. We've talked about it a lot during this, this program. It's one of my favorite birds. I'm gonna, as we move into fall and wood thrush are, are actually migrating right now. Um, they're starting to migrate. These birds have a long distance to go. Um, fall migration typically 
proceeds much more slowly than spring migration. And so wood thrush and other neotropical migrants are, are leaving us right now. So we'll, we won't hear them much until next spring. So we can get a chance to listen here. Here's the wood thrush song played at regular speed, which many of you may recognize. Beautiful melodic. So birds have two syrinxes. They're kind of like our voice boxes. Um, most birds, only one syrinx is well-developed and that's the one they use to create vocalizations. In all of the thrushes, both voice boxes or both syrinxes are well-developed muscularly and can be controlled independently of one another. So that's part of what makes the wood thrush song so beautiful is that these birds can actually sing a duet with themselves because they functionally have two voices at once. So here's the wood thrush song played at half speed, and you'll actually be able to hear each syrinx doing its thing because it's making a little different sound. You hear that two distinct sets of sounds? I'll play it again just so you can really get it. There's one, two, Two. You hear the very different, very different sounds from the same bird. So they can sing those little duets with themselves. Obviously, we have a lot of partners in this. We couldn't do it by ourselves um, over all of these, but uh, many, many thanks to all of them for funding support and all sorts of other kinds of support. And thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I went a little bit longer than I'd hoped, um, but uh, if there's time, happy to answer questions. I know one I would like to start on. This is an absolutely fantastic overview as far as kind of communicating the importance and literally birds are the, uh, the canary in the coal mine, right? It's the help showing how healthy our community environments are. But uh, you mentioned there's, there's such a broad spectrum of variables that come into actually managing some of these tasks and things. So um, uh, we, we were talking about potentially moving on and creating some other future topics. So like what would the uh, next step or what would the next kind of piece of information to help put these puzzles together? Now that we've seen the cover, you know, what is our first piece to put it down? Yeah, I mean, if, if you, you know, if you, if you have privately owned land that you're wanting to manage, or you're managing land as part of, you know, your, your work, uh, municipality or whatever it is, I would recommend picking up the Healthy Forest Guide. Um, it's going to lay out a strategy for evaluating what you have and where to go from there. One thing to keep in mind is that you know, unless you're a professional, you know, professionally trained forester or land manager, you sometimes need to get a consulting forester involved. Um, there's lots of consulting foresters out there, many really good ones. Um, Audubon is actually working on a program. We, we train a lot of foresters and we're working on an endorsement program where we'll actually have Audubon endorsed foresters that we can recommend uh, to folks who can begin working on bird friendly forestry projects. But yeah, I would say, you know, pick up the healthy forest guide, read through the, the parts about evaluating your site um, and then contact me if you have questions about how to move forward. And I know you mentioned some of those other resources out there in Pennsylvania, we're fortunate we have Penn State Stench, you know, Penn State University Extension, which is a fantastic agricultural program in multiple facets of things, but the, anyone in other states can look into essentially any land grant school out there. And there should be some kind of extension services along with the programs of that university. And that, that's a great state great resource, resource that does tend to be free. Yeah, yes, absolutely true. I mean, you know, uh, university extension systems are wonderful. And I would also point out that, you know, while the Healthy Forest Program or uh, publication that I keep referring to was written for Pennsylvania, it's applicable almost anywhere. You have 
northern hardwood forest or oak hickory forest. So from, you know, central Vermont on down through uh, Virginia, you know, I, there are, I mean, there are some cases where no, it's not going to be applicable, but it will be applicable in a broad swath area and including, you know, probably places in, um, you know, the Great Lakes region in the upper Midwest, where you also get into some eastern hardwood forest or not eastern, but deciduous forest. Well, and even in the Pacific Northwest, you start hitting some of that similar kind of areas too, depending on where you're located. So as respect to everyone, we want to thank you for spending the past hour with us chatting about habitat establishment specifically for forest birds, but we also learned quite a bit about uh, different types of things we can apply into our own communities and municipalities, you know, even if we go with the lens of urban forests. And uh, Ron, I wanna thank you for helping us to take our first step on this guide. And uh, we, we're definitely gonna be pulling on you to come back and gain some more aspects from you. And maybe we can uh, pull some of that info out of you piece by piece. Absolutely, happy to do it. Hope you all have a great day and thank you for joining us. Thank you everyone. I'm BK from Park Maintenance Institute. We thank you for joining us for this shop talk and we will uh, hope to see you for many more.